It is my great honor and pleasure to be with all of you today. Will this be translated or everyone knows English? Translating. He was translating. <laughs> Is it necessary that Maharaj translates? <laughs> Is it nodig that the sentiments that he can Engels can understand? Can you fingers up shaking? Die geeft totaal geen Engels Ja, is een mensen die geen Engels Eén persoon kan dat niet. Als één of twee zijn, dan gaan we vertalen. Dus daarom heeft die Yes. 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 Have any of you ever been to New Dwarka in Los Angeles? Have you been to Srila Prabhupada's personal quarters? In Srila Prabhupada's personal quarters? Los Angeles was the national headquarters of ISKCON for all of the United States. And he sp spent a lot of time there, translating his books, translating Shri Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Chaitanya He spent a lot of time there, giving hundreds of lectures, and in his room, meeting individual devotees, meeting groups of leaders, giving vision to our whole society. <laughs> And I am feeling very at home here because in Prabhupada's rooms, all the walls are blue just like this. Yeah. Do you know why the walls were blue? One of Srila Prabhupada's... Hare Krishna. One of Prabhupada's... Hare, one of Hare Krishna. Microphones are very controversial here. So it's right. <laughs> right now. It's okay. Some different kinds of personality. One of his personal associates told me the reason why they made his walls blue is because he told them when he was a child in Calcutta, he grew up in a room that had blue walls. And he liked it very much. <laughs> so when they made his quarters in Los Angeles, they went through great efforts to make it very nice. And the walls were just like this. So why am I telling you this story? Because it came from my heart. <laughs> I didn't know what I was supposed to talk about tonight. <laughs> 
but there is a message. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a beautiful verse. Atapum beard we just traced us, Varna Shwami Bhagasha, Shwanushtatasya Dharmasya Samsidya Hari Tosha. The perfection of our occupational duties, the, per- the perfection of all Dharma, of all religion, of our occupation, of our family, of everything we do in life is that we please Krishna. We please the Supreme Lord. If Krishna is pleased, whatever the apparent material result of something is, it's perfectly successful. If we become famous, if we make huge fortune, if we conquer great lands, but we don't please Krishna, then spiritually, we have failed. And if we try with all earnestness, integrity, in a spirit of true devotion, even if apparently we're not successful, we're perfectly successful. Can I give you an example? This is just coming from the blue walls, these stories. Because you see, everybody simply wanted to please Srila Prabhupada. And when Yasya Prasada, Bhagavat Prasada, Yasya Prasada Nagati Guto. When the Guru's pleased, Krishna's pleased. And when Krishna's pleased, that's our perfection. So in the Ramayan, yes? Maybe the phone can go up. Because people are complaining that they can't hear you. Should I enter into a man? Should I enter a managerial mode? <laughs> Two speakers, and one should be in the middle of the room, mm-hmm. and one should be up ahead. Can this go forward? Please put the sound soft. Can we Can we lift up that stool? Take the other one as far back as it may go. Can I prove? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. No, no, just here. There's no wires. The other one on top. Please give me the one wire with the pizza. Krishna Prabhu. Speaking for Krishna Prabhu. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Can you hear better now? I'm 
ました。<笑><笑>
was so determined to help Sita with his wings, he just pushed all the arrows off and attacked Radha again. And he was actually winning the fight. But as hours went by, he became so tired because he was old. And at that time, Ravana, with a sword, <laughs> cut off Jatayu's wings and legs. And Jatayu fell to the ground, bleeding profusely. And poor Sita, when she saw her devotee, he didn't have a chance of winning. But he would rather die than stand and watch this injustice. And he gave everything he could with love. At that time, Sita embraced Ra Jataya and said, such a devotee you are. You sacrifice everything for me because of your love for Ra. There is no friend like you. You have completely conquered my heart. Ravana grabbed Sita and dragged her away, went into the air to take her to Sri Lanka. Meanwhile, Ram and Lakshman were searching everywhere for Sita. They couldn't find her. They were going through the forest. And finally they came to a clearing and they saw blood. And they were thinking, <coughs> what is this? And then they saw this big Jatayu laying there bleeding. And they were thinking that he ate Sita. And Ram said, I will, what you have done? And he had his arrow pointed at Jatayu. And Jatayu's life <laughs> said, I'm Jatayu, <laughs> trying to protect Sita. Oh, Ram said, you are Jatayu. He put down his bow and arrow. He said, what happened? And Jatayu told him the story. And Ram put Jatayu's head on his lap. And when Jatayu was just on the verge of death, Ram said that because of the love and the devotion that you have offered in trying your best to please me, on this very day, I will send you to the spiritual God to be my eternal associate. On this very day, I will award you Mukti, the highest liberation of Prema Bhakti, ecstatic love of God. And then he embraced the body of Jatai. And Jatai, you're looking at Ram with his eyes, chanted Ram's names, Ram, 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 and gave up his life. And his eternal soul was transported to the spiritual abode. Ram started to cry. The death of my father has not pained me so much. The loss of Sita has not pained me so much. Being exiled from all the citizens of Ayodhya has not hurt me so much the loss of a devotee, a friend, and a lover like Chitayu. And then Ram personally performed the last rites for his body. So my simple question to all of you, we can take a poll, as they say. Who won that who won that battle? Did Ravana win? Ravana? <coughs>
Chaitanya tried to get Sita, and he couldn't. Ravana did. Chaitanya tried to stop Ravana, he couldn't. Ravana kept going. Ravana lived in the fight, and Chaitanya died. But who won the fight? Chaitanya. Yeah, raise your hand if you think Ravana. <laughs> Ravana won, but he lost. He won because he, but he lost his integrity. We're glorifying Jatayu even ages later, and we all hate Ravana. <laughs> yes? One lived a little longer physically, but he was condemned to a horrible destiny. And one died to enter into eternal life. So those of you who think that Jatayu won that fight, raise both of your hands and loudly say, Hari Bo. So he lost, but he won. How is that? Because Jatayu pleased Ram. And Ravana did not. That's the standard of success. This is Bhagavad Gita's teachings. Krishna tells Arjuna, you just try with the right character, with the right integrity to please me with devotion. And that is the success. The external result is not really important. We have to try for the result as part of our devotion. But it's in the effort that our success is. This is Bhakti. Patra Pushpam Palanto Yam Yoni Bhakta Prayashya. Krishna tells you, Gita, even if you offer with me with love and devotion a fruit, a flower, or a little water, I will accept. And that's the perfection of our life. And Krishna accepts our devotion. There's a beautiful story in Krishna's Leela. When he was only about three years old, between two and three, he was living in Gokul. His mother, Yashoda, his father, Nanda, his brother, Balaram. And one day, this very simple, uneducated lady who just lived in the forest. She had no caste, she had no social status, she was just living in the jungle. And she would collect fruits and bring them to villages to try to sell them. And in those days, there wasn't currency, money. There was, people would barter, they would trade what they had for something else. So this old, simple lady, she came into Gokul and she called out, if anyone wants fruits, I have fruits. And little Krishna Gopal heard this, and he wanted fruits. <laughs> so very quickly he grabbed some grains of wheat, unhusked <coughs> grains. And in his little hand, tiny little hand, he went running to buy fruits. And he was so enthusiastic as he was running. The, the grains were coming and were falling from the sides of his hands, they were falling from between his fingers. And finally, he came to the lady. He didn't even look at his hand. He just said, give me fruits, give me fruits. And she looked at his hand, and there was hardly a single grain sitting in his hand. What is that worth? But she became so charmed by Krishna's little smile. She just wanted to please him. She didn't know he was God. She just thought he's just an ordinary little boy. But he's charmed my heart, and I want to please him. So she said, my child, I'll give you all the fruits you can carry. 
and she filled his hands with fruits, and then she filled his arms with fruits, and he, he was just holding as many fruits as he could. And then, and then you know, she took the grain, <laughs> and then Krishna ran home with all the fruits. Shukadev Goswami from the Bhagavad Purana tells that her basket, because she gave Krishna those fruits, her basket overflowed with the most precious jewels. There were diamonds, rubies, emeralds, pearls, gold, silver. All that stuff they have in Antwerp. <laughs> <laughs> That's the place, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> but this was better than these for celestial jewels. And her basket was literally flooding over with what would be worth today probably hundreds of millions of dollars worth of jewels. Now, Jiva Goswami explains some inner secrets to this story that with your permission, I would be honored to reveal to you. <laughs> this simple, old, uneducated tribal lady, she saw how happy Krishna was because he gave him the, because she gave him the fruits. He was smiling and he was running home to show his mother all the fruits he had. And that was the greatest pleasure of her heart. She pleased Krishna. She gave Krishna so much happiness. <coughs> the Srimad Bhagavatam explains when you water the root of the tree, every part of the tree is happy. Yes? If you go around and put water on every flower and every leaf and every twig, nothing's really happy. But if you put water on the root, every part is satisfied. <coughs> Aham sarvasya prabhava matta sarvam prabhartate iti matva pajalati maam bhuta bhava That Krishna is the root of everything that exists. He's the cause of all causes. He's the source of everything. If we worship him with devotion, if we please Krishna, then we're watering the root of the tree of all of creation and all of existence. And then we can be completely satisfied. And we can actually be empowered to deeply satisfy the hearts and the souls of others. So she was so happy. She was feeling such ecstasy, making Krishna happy. She wanted to give him more fruits. So she was going to run back into the forest where she had a little hut and get all the rest of her fruits and bring them back and give them all to Krishna. So she picked up her basket and ran back. And she was so enthusiastic to get those fruits. She was in such a state of, of, of desire to do save a service. She didn't notice that her basket probably weighed like a lot because it was filled with jewels. And then she got back to her hut in the forest and she collected all the other fruits and she went to put them in the basket and then she saw her basket was full of jewels. First time she noticed it. Would you like to know what she did? She was thinking that they're an impediment to bring fruits to Krishna. She just carelessly dumped them all out and filled the basket with fruits and ran off to give it to Krishna. And when she got back to Goloka, she called out, Gopal, Gopal, I have more fruits for you. I have more fruits. She went right to his house. And Gopal came out and took the rest of her fruits. And smiled. He didn't even give her a single grain the next time. <laughs> and she was so happy. The ultimate sweetest of all fruits is Krishna praying. Love of Krishna. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained that he was a gardener. And he was teaching us how to garden. 
He was giving everyone the seed, the bhakti beach, the seed of devotion, the seed of love for Krishna. And he's teaching us by hearing about Krishna and by chanting Krishna's names and glories, we water that seed. And when the seed becomes, we have to be very careful to guard against the weeds of immorality, dishonesty, arrogance, greed, passionate selfishness, envy. These are weeds that will choke the seed of devotion. We have to be very careful to root out those weeds while watering the seed of devotion. And ultimately, it bears the fruit of Prema Bhakti. And that fruit, if you taste a single one, it satisfies you for the rest of eternity completely. Anandam Bhudibharatanam Pratipatam Punam Vritasvadanam. The taste that we're always seeking is the taste of this love for God. The first and great commandment, according to the Bible, is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And the natural result of that is you love your neighbor as yourself, and everyone is your neighbor because everyone is a part of God. Krishna tells, I'm the father of all and mother of all living beings. Lord Chaitanya, he said, I have so many of these fruits of love of God. I simply want to distribute them to everyone, everywhere. I don't expect any price. I just want you to accept it. And all those who are my followers, the greatest way you could please me is to taste the sweet, the sweetness of love of Krishna and to help me distribute it to the world. For there's so much suffering. Krishna, he had all these fruits, and he approached his mother Yashoda and showed her all the fruits. <laughs> Meanwhile, the fruit selling lady, she attained the fruit of love of Krishna, Krishna Prema. Just by giving him little fruits, she attained the ultimate perfection, even beyond what Jatayu attained. <laughs> Just by giving Krishna some fruits and making him happy. You see, you don't have to die. <laughs> That's why I'm telling the story after two times. How did we get bloody and die? You can just give some fruits. <laughs> the emotions are everywhere. The principle is that. <laughs> so. Perfection. It's such a simple, she didn't have an education. She wasn't a Brahmin. She didn't do any great tapasyas or pujas. She didn't do any yantras or mantras or tantras or pujas or pujas. <laughs> pujas. She just served with love. And Krishna was pleased. And the whole purpose of mantra, yantra, tantra, mudra, puja, and everything else is just to get that devotion. To to cultivate that desire to please the Lord in our heart through our actions, our words, our thoughts. Ultimately through our love. So Krishna was so happy with these fruits. He showed his mother, look what I got, look what I got. And she said, where did you get these? And Krishna said, some lady came in and, and, and I bought them all. <laughs> I saw this lady come out of the forest and I bought all the fruits. <laughs> and Yashoda Mai said, she was worried because little Gopal was just starting to you know, run around. And she said, Gopal, you, you can't just trust everybody you meet. It's not like everybody is, is in your, like the people in your family. You can't trust everybody. And Gopal smiled at her and said, mother, I don't know what this means to not trust anybody. 
And she's, and then Gopal Paul said, these fruits are so good. Let's give them out to all our friends and all our family and all the Vrijabhasis. So Yashoda Mai, what was her goal in life? To please Krishna. So Krishna wanted these fruits to be distributed. So he, Yashoda Mai, there wasn't that many because his arms were only this big. Only this big. <laughs> So she wrapped up the fruits in her sari, and she went out and started giving the fruits, and Krishna was watching. Give to that person, give to that person. And all these different Pujabhasis were coming, and she was giving one fruit after another after another. Whoever tasted those fruits became ecstatic. And the amazing thing is hard. she only had a few fruits. And she gave everyone a whole fruit. And hundreds of people came. And somehow or other, no matter how many fruits she came out, there was still more fruits in her side. There was never more than four or five at a time. She gave out a hundred, and there was still four or five in her side. Now, does that sound impossible? It is. But that's why Krishna's so wonderful. He doesn't care about what's in the house. <laughs> we, we have to take that into consideration. <laughs> Krishna is the absolute truth. The cause of all causes. Somebody, how is it that he could take five, six fruits and his mother, for then for hours she's distributing fruits. <laughs> Well, how is it that the sun has been burning in the sky for millions and millions and millions of years and nobody, there's not a, a petrol line fueling it. There's no, you know, there's no demigods chopping wood for a minute to keep the fire. It's just burning. Years and it's not even getting any smaller. That's quite amazing, isn't it? <laughs> quite impossible. We see it every day. We just and we, and we put on our sunglasses so that we don't get disturbed by the sun. <laughs> that's, how, that's how we appreciate. The sun sustains all life. Nothing could grow in this planet without the sun. No crops could grow. There would be no rain. We would freeze to death. Our life is 100% totally dependent on the sun at every moment, even at night. <laughs> wow. One devotee. Two days ago, when I was in Ratadesh, told me that his doctor told him that 75, 90% of this doctor's patients living in the Netherlands and Belgium, 90% had vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin. You get vitamin D when you go into the sun and you get the benefits. The Gayatri Mantra is honoring and offering our gratitude to Krishna, who's giving us light, giving us heat, giving us life through the sun. So I think this, this plague within the world of vitamin D deficiency is very symbolic. <laughs> but we're not really appreciating, we're not really grateful we're not really assimilating the blessings of God that's coming in every way in our life. How is it that the little seed this big grows into a gigantic in California? I was just in a place with my god brother Vaisheshya where there are redwood trees. How many of you have seen redwood trees? They're in Northern California and some other places. The biggest trees in the world. So 
Can I give you an example? The second largest redwood tree. I read, because it has a description of it under the tree, it's a gigantic tree. 40 fully grown European adults, yes? If they reached out their arms, holding hands, it would take 40 people to go around the tree. It's the base of the tree. That's like this room. And do you know what basketball is? Yes. The ball is like about this big. If you hollowed out the tree, you could put, I believe it was 175,000 basketballs in it. Hmm? And you know table tennis? <laughs> if you don't like basketball, <laughs> you could put something like 2.3 million ping pong balls in it. Now, if you don't like basketball or ping pong, but you like to just drive around in your car, if you fill that hollowed out tree, one tree, with petrol, gasoline, and put it on your car, you can drive around the world 2.2 times without ever having to stop for gas. So, the conclusion is, it's a really big tree. <laughs> it's at least 1,700 years old. But then you look, and the tree has these cones, and the cones are very hard, but if the cone breaks open somehow or other, you see that the seeds are about this big. I was observing, I was analyzing, I was investigating. It was really interesting to me. And I was thinking, how is it that a tree this big is inside a seed? That's this size. We see miracles at every moment of life. But we're just so accustomed to them, we're not thrilled. You know, all these people walking around, they were all little seeds. Kind of slimy seeds, you know. <laughs> passes to, from the father into the mother, and then it kind of goes kind of swishes around all over the place there, and then it gets emulsified with the ovums, and then all of a sudden little eyes start coming, and little legs start coming, and little brains start growing, and lungs, and kidneys, and <laughs> <laughs> <Yes, it is. laughs> And, you know, evacuating organs, and reproductive organs, and ears, and nose, and tongue. How's it all happening? It's not that the father and mother are like, you know, software engineers, you know, <laughs> they don't even know it. They don't even know the child's there until after a couple of months. Uh, it's a miracle. Every human being is a miracle. Every dog, every cat, every mosquito is a miracle. Fly. Can you imagine how many years it took for humans to invent an airplane? And if you, you know, I recently came to Heathrow Airport. And in London, there's the Olympics. And because of the Olympics, so many people are coming there. So there were all kinds of delays in the airport. Yeah, so the air traffic control is telling the plane, you know, just keep flying around. Just keep flying around. There's no place for you to land. Right? Well, you know, I've seen mosquitoes under one light. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands under one light. Oh, yeah. There's no air traffic controller. <laughs> and I've never seen any two mosquitoes crash. <laughs> they have wings, they have tails, they can stick and go up, down, they, and they don't even need runways. They can land on the on the head of a needle and take off, yes? And you know, it's not that, you know, the, the NASA scientists are creating the 
the aerodynamics of a mosquito. It's just, they're just born to do that. It's a miracle. We're seeing incredible miracles everywhere. Instead of being thrilled to think, look, look at that mosquito, how it's going like that, all there, and look at all these people, and they were doing, 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 how do they become like this, and they're all different colors, and they have all different psychologies, and they're all just coming from these slimy little seeds, and what's happening? <laughs> this is unbelievable, it's incredible. Creation is miracle after miracle after miracle, there's nothing but miracles, and the sun is rising, and the sun is setting, and somehow the earth, if it gets a little too close, it's burned to ashes, if it gets a little too Far, everybody dies, and millions and millions of years, it just stays where it is. And it's moving, and it's all moving too. <laughs> so, if the creator of all this wants to provide fruits, <laughs> <laughs> From his mother, sorry to everyone. All we could do is just smile and say, Some people think with this how Krishna's lifting over down hill with little finger of left hand. Mythology, mythology. And the devotees, we just see the miracles Krishna's crying all around us. If Krishna wants to lift a hill with his left finger, it's, it's simply wonderful. It's no question of mythology, it's a no question of impossible, it's simply wonderful. It simply makes our love for him, our gratitude to him, and our desire to serve him more and more and more whenever we hear with faith. so eager to let everyone taste. What were those fruits? Those fruits were the love of that simple, uneducated fruit vendor. It wasn't the fruit that Krishna accepted from her. It was the love in which she offered him. She wanted to please him. Prabhupada said, Krishna doesn't accept the thing you offer. He accepts the intent, the purpose the affection in which it's offered. Krishna, that fruit tasted so good to Krishna, the fruit of this simple lady's love, he wanted everyone to taste it. He wanted everyone to be liberated by her love. Yes, she attained the ultimate success by such a simple gesture. And those other jewels, she attained something that made them like broken pieces of glass. The Purusharta Siromani, the crest jewel of all goals of life. Bring the back. So this is the jewel that Lord Chaitanya, this is the fruit that Lord Chaitanya came to give to the world. This is the fruit that Srila Prabhupada came and traveled around the world 11 times and went through so many great difficulties. He already was tasting the fruit. He was in Vrindavan, in the holiest place of Krishna's Rasa Lila. He came on that old cargo ship across two oceans and three continents, 38 days just to share those fruits with others. Krishna tells in Gita, one who gives this message to others is most feared. And Lord Chaitanya said, if, if you want to please me, taste this fruit of love of God and distribute it to the world. And how do we taste it and how do we distribute it? We'll be chanting with holy names. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. 
and Srila Prabhupada established temples all over the world. And he was very enthusiastic. It began like a little seed with this tiny little storefront on the Lower East Side of New York, 26 Second Avenue. And then he expanded it by some of his devotees from there going to San Francisco and buying a storefront that was just slightly bigger on Frederick Street in Haight Ashbury. And then there was a temple opened in um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Montreal, Canada, and Boston, Massachusetts. And then Srila Prabhupada sent six of his families, Krihastas, husbands and wives, to London. Do you know what's interesting? Well, first he sent Shivananda to Germany. And then he sent these six devotees, and they went to Amsterdam. They came to Holland. And it was from here that they, one by one, all went into London. The Prabhupada wanted a temple. They had no money. They didn't know anybody. But they, are, they had faith that Prabhupada's performing such incredible miracles of love because of his devotion. If we just want to help him, we could do it too. And so they had a beautiful five-story building just a block away from the British Museum on Berry Place in downtown London, the Camden District just a couple blocks from Westminster. And they were living with John Lennon of the Beatles, Prabhupada and all the devotees, but they had no place to live. And they were trying to renovate this building. And soon, they were in the building, and it was just six of them. And you know, a couple others joined, what are we gonna do with this five-story building? And within a couple of years, not even that, the building was overflowing with hundreds of devotees. 
the first, I became a devotee in India. I met Prabhupada in Bombay, and then I became a devotee in Vrindavan and met him again. But there was no ISKCON temples in India then. The first temple I ever went to in my whole life was on my way back from India in a place that you all heard of. It's a city called Amsterdam. Batania <laughs> Strat. I don't know if I say it properly. Yeah, that's good. But I know how to say here and I say I hope I said it right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry. It was in the middle of the red light district. <laughs> I didn't know where I was going. I was lost, and all of a sudden, I see Radha Krishna Temple. <laughs> so I knock on the door. His devotee answers and sees me. Some some sailors already like were pushing me down, and the prostitutes were pulling, trying to pull my dhoti off because it was just like a babaji in Vrindavan. They were really, I was walking through this place, and, and I was running away from everybody because I looked pretty strange, actually. This was 1972. I'm coming from the bank of the Yamuna in Brindaban, and now I'm in the red light district of <laughs> <laughs> Two days later, Much better to hitchhike, actually, these airplanes. <laughs> Too fast. <laughs> but, um, his devotee answers the door and looked at me like, what are you? I mean, nobody ever saw anybody like me. You know? Mad, long hair, I have dope. Long beard. <laughs> Chatter. And he, I said, can I come in? And he said, yes, come in. And he gave me hot milk with bananas crushed in it and cardamom seeds. <laughs> oh, so nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it was this beautiful tape of Prabhupada singing and it was paintings of Krishna and Radharani. And I was thinking, this is like an oasis in a desert. <laughs> that was the first temple I ever went to. And my dearest friend was Baladev Prabhu's father. That time he was Bhakta Hank. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I stayed for a month and then I went to Berry Place in London, where I stayed there for a while. But then I later on, Bhakta Hank became initiated by Prabhupada and Hare Krishna Prabhu. <laughs> And I remember in London, when I went there in 72, it was so overcrowded. There were devotees everywhere. You know, I, I was used to sleeping on riverbanks, but at least I was kind of alone. <laughs> so when I came there, I, I said, you know, is there any particular place I should sleep? They said, any, any floor space you find. <laughs> But I couldn't find it. <laughs> Every room was just completely covered with those. You couldn't even step between people hardly. And devotees were sleeping on the stairs. And I found a place between stairs. <laughs> and I've been very happy. I slept very nicely. But one time, George Harrison of the Beatles came to visit Prabhupada there and he saw all those people and he said, Prabhupada, it's very crowded. And Prabhupada said, would you like to get us another place? <laughs> <laughs> so he got us Bhakti Vedanta Manor. Hey, hey, oh. And Prabhupada made that his European head. And wow, so many temples and so many places. And what is the purpose of these temples? A place where we could congregate, inspire each other, enliven each other. A place where we could come together and do common service. And a place where we can invite the whole world to taste the fruits of bhakti, of Krishna Kaya. So 
very, very happy that I heard that you are endeavoring to build this beautiful temple here in Den Haag. <laughs> Did I say it correctly? Yes. It's a very important city in the world. international attention is here. And I've never been here before. And, and actually, I was wondering, what am I doing going to Den Haag? Yeah. So I'm, I'm just a little, kind of a little creature that crawls around. But I get many places I'm being asked to go. And when I, when I told somebody I'm going to Den Haag, they go, what are you going there for? I'm so thrilled, I'm so honored, because, you know, there are devotees here who want to do something wonderful for Prabhupada, for Lord Chaitanya, for Krishna, do something wonderful for God, do something wonderful for all humanity, do something wonderful for all living beings. By creating a spiritual university, a spiritual cultural center, a spiritual temple for the Lord. It's beautiful. For this, just to show my gratitude, my appreciation to Shamsundar and his family, and to Bal Govinda Prabhu, yes. and to Arvind Netra Prabhu, and to who else? <laughs> huh? All the members, not us. <laughs> to all of you. Because you see, nothing great happens without struggle. And that's how we grow. That's how that fruit of love comes to, to blossom in our heart. Is when together we take serious responsibility. And this is such a blessed opportunity. Through great effort, from what I understand, the government was giving us a plot of land and approved of us building a beautiful temple. And I saw the plans for the temple. Huh? Yes. Incredible. Can you imagine this? It's a blessing. But it's not that one or two people could do it. Krishna doesn't want it like that. He wants all of us to come together to take responsibility, to make sacrifices, to do something wonderful for the pleasure of Krishna and for the upliftment of humanity. So I, sometimes I say a lot of things, but my purpose of saying all of this is just to tell you how grateful I am to all of you and to encourage you to really try to inspire each other and work hard for this common cause as a family. There's millions of things that Maya will give us to fight about, but none of them have any importance. There's one thing that is millions and trillions of times more important, and that's what we have to cooperate with for. To please Prabhupada, to please Krishna, to water the root of all creation, to, to experience the ultimate satisfaction in the heart and to share that with the world. And from Prabhupada's perspective, projects we can work together like this are opportunities for that. So it's wonderful. And I thank you very much. And Krishna, in the Gita, he tells 
Ananya Chindayantomam Yajana Paryu Pashate Tesha Nitya Yoktana Yokakshimam Bahamya. And if you just sincerely try to serve me in a surrendered mood, I will preserve what you have and I will carry what you lack. And actually, it's beautiful, but it's a simple project. It's very easy to do. But Krishna won't let it be easy. <laughs> because he wants to bless us with an opportunity to really put our heart and soul in. And if we please Krishna, our life is a success. Whether the temple is built or not built, if we work together, chanting the holy names, living with good character, trying to do this. From a Lord Chaitanya's perspective, where he says, I'm a fruit vendor and I have so many fruits of love of God. This is a very nice fruit selling stall. <laughs> <laughs> and what are we selling it for? Nityananda Prabhu said, in this Namhata. We're giving Krishna Prema through Krishna now. Just come and enjoy. Just accept it with faith. That's all. So this really is an opportunity to very, in a very blissful and exciting way enter into Lord Chaitanya's eternal past. Jitayu and um, uh, Ravan. Um, although we know that Ravan uh, is living there immortal, uh, still his original uh, uh, duty was to, to please the Lord uh, in satisfying his greed. Uh, what then is still the, the difference between his devotion and the one of, uh, of Ravan? Jitayu uh, and, and Ravan. What makes it makes one uh, more perfect than the other. I'm not sure if I understand your question, but I'll try to answer it anyway. <laughs> Hanuman, Chitayu, he wanted to please Ram. Ravana. He wanted to please his own ego, his own mind, his own senses. To tell you, he was actually in ecstasy, even in his suffering, because he was doing it for Ram. Hanuman was in ecstasy when his tail was on fire, because he was jumping around, burning mantra. For Ram. Yes? So are we doing it to satisfy our ego? Are we doing what displeases the Lord, or are we doing what pleases the Lord? That's the difference. Arjuna, Duryodhana, they were doing exactly the same thing physically. They were driving chariots, they were shooting arrows, they were beating clubs, they were organizing militaries. Arjuna did it to please Krishna. And Duryodhana did it out of envy, lust, and greed. Still, what I meant to say, being uh, one of the gatekeepers, um, Ravan was actually fulfilling the desire of, um, of Lord Vishnu. That he, he wanted, Lord Vishnu wanted to fight. But, him, but the way he was pleasing him, 
was by playing the role of someone who completely displeased her, just to show the world. Ravana was totally displeasing Ram. But Jai and Vijay, they took that role to please the Lord, but in that role they totally displeased the Lord. Does that make sense? <laughs> that is what he's asking. Huh? That is what he's asking. Because that's why that's the way the Lord teaches the world. Well, you know, the Supreme Personality of Godhead doesn't come to this world for just little demons like us. <laughs> he wanted to show people who, who, were, who were insurmountable in power and strength and how even they will fail if they're not in the side of Dharma. Eventually, for a while, they succeed. Hiranya Kashipu did conquer the universe for a while. Ravana did manifest the entire Sri Lanka and took Pushpaka from his brother. So for some time they all succeeded in incredible ways with incredible power. But eventually, however intelligent we are, however many strength, however many yogic cities, however much wealth, it's not worth it. Any other questions? Yes. Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances yes. as a dust of your lotus feet. Parvati Mata has a request. She wants some kirtan. Listen to some kirtan from you. But she doesn't dare to ask. No. Haribo. <laughs> Yes, one question and then we will have your time. Could you could you maybe say something on integrity and what does it mean for a devotee to lose his or her integrity or how do we keep or lose our integrity? Krishna has given us through the scriptures, through the sadhus, through Srila Prabhupada, the loving father of Chaya, has given us sacred principles that are ideals in life. The principles of humility, the principles of honesty, the principles of gratitude, the principles of being faithful to our sadhana. Principles of compassion. These are sacred <coughs> principles. The, the principles of morality. The four negative principles just help us to become basically moral. But the principles that are given are way beyond that. We're not supposed to be fault finding, we're not supposed to be, we're supposed to be well wishers to people. But in this world, anything good, anything sacred, is going to be tested seriously. And those tests are dangerous. Because if we compromise these sacred principles, we lose grace. We lose our connection with Krishna is covered, more so. But if, in the face of these tests, we maintain our, these principles, then we grow in wisdom, in realization, and we access even more abundance of grace. So integrity means to maintain the sacred ideals we have been given, even when there's temptation. Temptation that if you give them up, you can get so much more. 
more power, more fame, more money, more physical pleasures. To maintain these sacred principles, even in the face of fear, if I don't give it up, I may lose so much. Yeah? Integrity means it's not a, on the basis of what's easy or what's hard. The conditioned, mundane way of calculating it. This is easy, this is hard. This is pleasing, this is displeasing. This is pleasurable, this is painful. But a person with integrity thinks that's not so important. The real question is, is it right? If it's right, it doesn't matter whether it's pleasurable, painful, hard or difficult, it must be done. A mother for a child. Does a mother think, I'm gonna take care of my child only when it's easy? When it's difficult, forget. I have other things to do. Hmm. No, a mother will do anything for the child because it's right. That's a mother with integrity. We have principles of what pleases Krishna and what displeases Krishna. And many things that please Krishna, we're going to be tempted to do something else. You can get so much. If you don't do something else, you may lose so much. But what do you get and what do you lose? It's not important. The only thing that's really important is our integrity. That we maintain our sacred ideals. Whether it's a sunny day or a stormy day. Does that answer your question? And our primary responsibility is to purify our heart. To live with good character. But in order for that character to actually have depth and realization, we have to cleanse our heart. And that especially comes through the benediction of Sankirtan.
Jiganya kasi pur baksanya. Jiganya kasi pur baksanya. Jiganya kasi pur baksanya. Yato yato yami tato narsina. Wahir narsina hita ye narsina. Narsila majin sadanam prapta. Gaudu Premanandi, 